Well, good day everyone. Uh, before I do the big reveal on the lathe uh, that I got, I thought I'd talk a little bit about what went into uh, that decision. Um, I don't know, maybe, maybe y'all find a little bit of value in that. I, I covered uh, a lot of things I look for uh, in the, in the uh, Sheldon overview videos. Um, so I'm going to try to keep this uh, pretty pretty brief and then we'll take a look at the new machine. Um, on, on this lathe, um, budget was a big factor which is, which is interesting because uh, honestly uh, I had a, a bigger budget uh, than I normally do when, when I've been looking or, or have come across lathes. Um, what was interesting is I couldn't find anything uh, used in my area that was that was worth anything. Um, they were just a lot of money for junk that I would spend a long time trying to get right and, and, and um, I, I don't need that right now. Um, so that kind of took care of itself and again I thought that was interesting because you know I had comparatively speaking uh, compared to when when I've bought my other machines I had a pretty decent sized budget um, it wasn't like 20 grand or anything like that but it was it was right around the the eight to eight to nine thousand dollar mark um, other things that was important to me was I wanted at least uh, an inch and three eighths uh, spindle bore diameter. That way, I can cover uh, all all of the barrels that I do uh, mostly. Um, a lot of people, I think, are led to believe that you have to have a two inch or better spindle bore to chamber rifles. Uh, inch and three eighths will handle a, a M24. Uh, profile easily, especially if it's a quality uh, barrel. Um, the only thing you can't do, uh, for example, is that the heavier, the super heavy barrels like the 50 BMG uh, and things like that, because it's going to be a two inch barrel, two inch, two inches in diameter barrel uh, blank. Um, and honestly, um, those don't come along very often. The, the, bulky, the bulk of my work and, and probably most people's work is going to be in that M24 and, and smaller. You know, your, your target down to uh, sporter barrels. Um, so I wanted an inch and three eighths spindle bore. Um, preferably uh, uh, a fairly short headstock, but that wouldn't have been a deal breaker if I came across something um, that was nice with a deep spindle bore, uh, with a deep headstock. Um, there's a million ways to skin that cat, um, so it, so it wasn't a big deal. Um, next thing was bed length uh, and and actual swing. I wanted at least a 10 inch uh, swing. Um, and at least a, a 36 inch bed uh, because I do uh, do some profiling and uh, occasionally turning on centers uh, or turning in the steady rather. Um, and the 10 inch swing, if you go with the 10 inch uh, with the uh, what the, on the older lays it'd be the large bore spindle which would be the inch and three eighths you know it's a good it's a decent size machine uh, it's not like thousands of pounds but it, it's it's a good weight and the rigidity is there um, you know basically if I could have found a, a south bend uh, heavy 10L like my, my old 1943 uh, model but newer and in better shape I would have what well, much better shape I would have gone with that in a heartbeat um, obviously, it had to have a tailstock, uh, preferably uh, with uh, that was graduated. I've always thought that'd be kind of nice, um, and it would have to have a steady rest. Uh, outside of that, uh, power options didn't matter to me. 
um, whether it was 120 or 220 or or uh, or, or a single phase or three phase I have I have single and three phase in the shop so that wasn't a worry um, and it had to cut threads uh, cut a full set of uh, a full range of standard threads metric not a big deal I don't do, don't do a lot of metric threading uh, and if I do uh, my big blue lathe uh, cuts uh, a full full range of threads um, so that was really it and uh, just you know did did a lot of uh, research and just a lot of scouting uh, in, a, in a pretty short amount of time but it was about, I spent a lot of time um, just looking at machines and and you know trying to justify certain budgets and going over my budget and I just when I came right down to it I didn't want to do that um, and I talked to a lot of a lot of people about this and, and I'll talk more about that when we uh, take a look at it uh, so anyway that that was about it in the in the decision process um, just things that I look for to me that's kind of like the minimum uh, the minimum things that I'm looking for when I'm when I'm shopping uh, for lathes specifically for uh, barrel work is uh, just a quick recap 10 inch swing at least a 36 inch bed uh, you can get away with less depending on the lathe and, and if you know you're not going to turn on centers um, got to have a tail stock uh, got to be able to cut standard threads and um, you know having that steady rest is is kind of nice um, and then obviously your budget don't don't go over your budget and get yourself thrown in a hole um, all that being said let's let's take a take a look at the new machine well everyone here it is this is the new lathe um, it's a grizzly uh, the model is a g0824 this is the uh, 1440 uh, gunsmithing lathe uh, weighs uh, 13 to 1500 pounds somewhere in there it's a, it's a good weight um, it um, I, they, they have another 1440 uh, that I was looking at. It, it's, it's a little bit less, uh, but this one has, not that this was important to me whatsoever, but this one has a, a two inch spindle bore. Uh, the other one is an inch and nine sixteenths, which would have been fine, uh, but this one came with a DRO. Um, I've never really, uh, I've used them, but I don't live by, uh, the DRO a lot on on the lathe my clausing uh, had a travadile which I, I loved I used that uh, quite a bit so uh, th this will be interesting um, but uh, this is what I went with and uh, I talked to a lot of people about it um, that use grizzly lathes um, and, and have been using them for years now and uh, they're, they're all still using them and they're still doing still turning out real nice barrels um, if you followed me for uh, since the beginning um, you'll know the, the that I had at one point a uh, the Grizzly uh, 4003 G which was which was their 12 by 36 lathe and I, I like that lathe it worked fine um, my, my problem with it was um, it it was a little it was a really extremely in my opinion it was extremely top heavy like I have this lathe set up in the middle of the shop um, or it's kind of in the middle of the well yeah it's in the middle of the shop um, relatively speaking it's it's not up against the wall like like I normally have my lathes set up um, so I have my workbench here and then the lathe is here so basically whatever I'm doing on the bench I can just turn around and there's the machine um, I, I felt like I could never ever do that with the 12 by 36 it just it, it it probably never would have but it always felt like if you just bumped it hard it would fall over and I, I didn't like that but other than that it was a good machine um, I had a lot of people ask me questions on that machine and and I you know if I was 
I wouldn't I wouldn't hesitate to buy another Grizzly. Um, one guy that uh, whose opinion I I valued quite a bit, and I actually called him last, and and that's why I figured if if uh, there was a bunch of bad responses, then I wouldn't. He's a pretty busy dude, and I, I didn't want to feel like I was wasting his time. But um, one guy I called on this deal was uh, Gordy, uh, Gordy Gritty, Gordy Gritters. Uh, he 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 runs Gordy's Precision, and and um, if you're into custom rifle building, he, you know he's he's pretty he's extremely well known. Um, and uh, he's also helped design these lathes and he's used them so um, his input was uh, very valuable um, he said they're good lathes they're they're very very accurate um, he told me there was some things to uh, watch out for when you're when you're threading and we'll see we'll see with this one if if that uh, happens or not it has nothing to do with chatter on this machine um, so based on that um, I called uh, what it, it, this really impressed me I called Grizzly uh, Thursday uh, which would be the 22nd of December and um, and it, you know started the process of getting the machine um, I didn't I didn't pull the trigger on it right then and there I, I still had you know I was like I you know I think it sounds good we worked out some good pricing um, I, was, I think it sounds good but just let me sleep on it a little bit and um, I'll call you tomorrow so I, I, I was up late looking at stuff and um, called them back first thing uh, Friday morning it was the 23rd of December and added to the list and I'll talk a little bit about that briefly, but I added uh, the big uh, 8,000 pound uh, leveling feet. They're, they're over three inches in diameter. Um, I think those work a lot better than the little leveling feet that they make for these machines. So I got those and um, I got a, a bison a six jaw true set chuck. And I'll, I'll show you that up close and personal in a little bit. Um, some nice things about the machine, uh, of course, it, it checked off all the boxes, it was turnkey, um, cuts full threads, although I have to change gears, um, I'll, it'll be okay because of, you know, the price, obviously, you're gonna, you know, you gotta balance that out, I, I think it'll be fine for me, um, it looks like depending on the thread that I'm cutting I can achieve my speed and feeds that I need to um, just there's one speed and feed I haven't been able to play with that enough yet uh, to see if that's going to be an issue but the, I may have to do some gear changing but it, it I've kind of done it and been through the process a little bit already and it, it's not a big deal uh, you know it's one of those for the price I'm not going to cry about it um, it has a short headstock, even with a six jaw chuck. Um, this will this will do a 26 inch barrel easily through the headstock, and I can support it with a spider. Uh, this is the first machine that I've had that I don't have to build an outboard spider for, so that's kind of nice. Uh, like I said, it came with a DRO. Um, it is uh, 70 rpm up to 2000 rpm is pretty much the same as the the 12 by 36 um, of course i've gone through and leveled and trued it up and gone through the break in and, and the thing that um, this is really nice machine compared to the 12 by 36 at those higher rpms that that little machines it just scared me at, at those higher rpms this is pretty darn solid um, one thing that they did that I really liked is they used to make this machine as a gap bed and um, they don't they they made it a solid it is no longer a gap bed and I think that's a huge improvement I think that adds to the rigidity of the machine um, so so that's great uh, has a LED light uh, flood coolant system built in uh, removable chip tray 
um, you know, jog button. It's got a, got a lot of features that, that I've got to get used to again uh, since using, using the carriage, um, since using the closing, excuse me. Um, so other than that, let's, uh, let's move up a little closer and, and I'll kind of show you some things that I've gone through and, and checked and show you a little bit about the machine and some things that might help you um, if you went out and, and are looking at a, at a machine yourself. Um, it'll be, be just some good checks to do and, uh, and things like that. Okay, so uh, before I go through a couple checks, I want to talk a, a little bit about some things. First, I'm going to do a whole video on setting the lathe up. Uh, my process for doing that. I think if you're new to rifle chambering and things like that, it's a good way to kind of get your mind a little bit introduced to precision uh, because it, it can be a very, uh, it's, it's an exercise in patience. Um, so I'll do a whole video on that. Um, this machine has been trued and, and, and uh, gone through the break-in process. Uh, so if you get a machine that's new, make sure you read your directions because it's going to vary. Um, and then, you know, you change, you, uh, change the oil. So you, 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 like this machine did not come with oil in the headstock. Head oil in the apron, head oil in the gearbox, but nothing in the headstock. So you, you, you fill the, I filled the headstock with the proper oil. Went through the break-in procedure, which was basically run it for 10 minutes in the first two or three gears. Um, and then after that, five minutes in each gear. Um, and then once all that's complete, you change the oil. Um, from there, one thing I like to do is uh, test spindle bearing runout. And you'll see a lot of people do this. Um, they'll take their test indicator, they'll get it on the spindle, they'll turn the spindle, and they'll say, look at that, I've got, uh, you know, a 10th hour runout. Uh, this, that's great, blah, blah, blah. That's not really how you do it because you're, you don't have any load on the bearings. Um, so, you know, there's no, no load. It's just got that layer of, of gear oil that, you know, takes up that slack. When you put weight on the spindle, i.e. round stock or barrel, it's going to put a load on those bearings. That's what you want to measure. So. What I did, and uh, if somebody's got a better way to do it, I'd like to know it, but this, is, this has always worked pretty good for me. Um, what I did is uh, I took the three jaw chuck, got it cleaned up, installed that on the lathe, took a, uh, it was a two and a half, three foot long piece of 4140 uh, that was two or two and a half inches in diameter. Um, for this, the, probably the thicker the better. Um, got that chucked up in the three jaw and then you put your dial indicator like on this machine right here on the spindle not on the chuck body but on the on the spindle hub itself and basically you just pick up on that bar at the end and then push down you know you're not trying to pick the machine up you're not trying to bend the pipe, but it is a, a consider, considerable force um, that you're putting on the spindle, and then you watch your dial, and whatever it moves up and down, that's pretty much your, your total indicated runout. Um, so on this machine, I started with the thou indicator. I was expecting probably half a thou. Um, well, I was expecting better than that, but um, the, it, they advertise this as a precision ground spindle with precision Japanese spindle bearings and so I was, I was actually um, hoping for some really good things um, and one other side note this particular machine came out of an ISO factory which means it actually had to go through an inspection and meet tolerance so um, to me that's a good thing it's probably a little bit better built a little bit better quality you would hope um, so anyway I did the thou indicator uh, didn't think I was getting enough uh, enough uh, push and pull on the bar so I tried a little harder I didn't get the needle to move 
I went to my um, my ten thousandths indicator, and it looked like I was getting about a half a tenth up and down, um, which would be a basically a ten thousandth total indicated run out. Uh, so to verify that, um, I grab my half a tenth indicator, which is five one hundred thousandths uh, test indicator, and that pretty much confirmed that it was, it was on the heavy side of of uh, half a tenth. Um, you know, it it's didn't didn't quite go up there, but in, in my brain, this this is sitting right around uh, one ten thousandth total indicated run out. So that is wonderful. Um, from there, I messed around with the three and four jaw chucks, which were those are actually a huge improvement from what you used to get. You used to get a, a Grizzly brand uh, chuck, I think or it was a no-name brand that came out of China. Now it's the San Yu or San Yu uh, three and four chaw chuck. Uh, they're, they're really pretty decent quality to be quite truthful. Um, I don't use three or four jaw chucks when I chamber and I'll do a whole video on that uh, later. Uh, like I said, um, I got the, the six jaw bison uh, true set chuck and I'll show you what this will do here in a minute. Um, but anyway, I, I played around with it, cut some threads, did some finish, um, did some finish work. Uh, that's that's kind of like my big test on the on any machine is let's cut some threads and see how it does. Uh, these are all dry threads. I didn't use any any oil with them or anything. This is a piece of 4140. This is 70 RPM here. This is 300 RPM here. Uh, that's a pretty nice uh, thread. And again, these are these are dry, and it's been sitting around for a couple days, so it's oxidized and it's got some dirt and grit still in it, you know. But I was looking more for chatter and things like that, and it just didn't happen. It's really pretty good thread. Uh, did some facing on it. Um, came out nice. Did a little counter bore on it came out you know finish is pretty good um, that's 4140 um, so then i went and got my uh, piece of just just a little extra barrel cut off that i had i save all this stuff doesn't matter how big it is and again cut some threads there's a dry thread on this as well and uh, thread real nice uh, faced real nice um, and then I kind of just wanted to see what the machine would do. So I grabbed this chunk. This is uh, surgical stainless. It's non-magnetic. And um, I did about a quarter inch uh, cut in two passes um, just to see, just to get a feel for the machine and how the finish would be. And uh, really, it was a mirror finish, but I got to feel it, and so I rubbed my rubbed my hands over it, and it got got a little dulled up from um, the oil, you know, just the oil that's in your in your fingers. But it did a real nice job on a facing cut. Um, it did did real nice so far. I'm I'm very happy. I've done a little bit more precise turning with it, and it's been been a really really good machine. Um, some things that I have to get used to that I'll talk to you about right now. Uh, hopefully you can you can see the dials. Um, so basically when you're when we're talking about uh, threading in machines, uh, this just for reference, this is your this is your compound. This is the cross slide uh, down here, uh, which I don't think you can see is the uh, the saddle. Um, one thing that, that threw me for a little bit of a loop is all of my machines, and I didn't even look, but all of my, she, my, my machines are what they call a direct read. And so what that means is for every, every tick, every little line, it, it's one thousandth. Uh, why is that important is because if you're turning a diameter, um, let's say you've you're, you got a half inch diameter part, and you're turning to uh, a finished diameter of 490, that's 10 thousandths off the diameter. 
on a direct read uh, dial, if I move this 10 thousandths, I'm actually going to remove 20 thousandths from the diameter because you have two sides. You have a front and a back. And I'll do a video on that because that, that confuses a lot of people. Then you have what they call an indirect read, um, which compensates for that so you don't have to do the math. It's just you, you every like on this machine, this is an indirect uh, read. So rather than thousandths, it measures two thousandths. It will cut a thou or a half a thou pretty darn accurate if, you know, like I use a DRO. I can cut a half thou very, very easily with this machine. Um, but that's something that um, it threw, threw me off for a little bit. And if, if you have problems threading, that's something you might want to check. Uh, because if, you, if you've got a direct or indirect, you may be taking too much cut or not enough cut. Uh, you do have to have tool pressure or you'll get, you'll get chatter. Um, Outside of that, uh, the backlash on this machine is great. Um, I, of course, to make me happy, um, it, it didn't take much. I think most of my machines have 30 to 40 thousandth backlash in them. Um, they're, you know, they're old machines. Uh, but I have basically um, a, a thou here, I have a thou here, and on the uh, saddle, one, two, three, Yep, four, so that'd be two thousandths backlash on the saddle, a thou on the uh, cross slide, and um, shoot a half a thou on the compound. And these, these are very, very smooth, very, very easy to use. I haven't adjusted these yet. Um, I don't know if I'm going to. Um, that's plenty acceptable for me. Um, if you take all the backlash out of them, um, you're just going to induce wear on your wear on your Gibbs that much quicker. And, and uh, really, even if you had sixty thousands of backlash, as long as you know where your preloads are, that's not a big a big deal anyway. Um, so outside of that, that was just something that threw me for a loop. Having having the on off uh, my my lever here. Uh, that took some getting used to as well because I got broke into my Colchester uh, pretty easy. So I was like, when I go to shut the machine off, it's I'm always reaching for the left rather than here. I'm getting used to that again, um, and then it's just a lot of buttons that I'm I'm getting used to. But that's that that's nothing. What I want to talk to you about briefly, just real quick, and and I'll do a whole demonstration video on this when we get to it is um, why um, there, there's a good friend of mine and I, and I, I get this uh, quite a bit. Um, you know, somebody will call up uh, just like he did and he said, hey, what are you doing? Because I'm getting, you know, three ten thousandths or two ten thousandths uh, run out on every chamber I do. Um, what are you doing that you can, you can not have that result? And the biggest thing is, um, in fact, my friend uh, Ryan Beck, he's a hell of a, hell of a custom uh, rifle builder up there in Pennsylvania. Um, he, he called me up with a similar problem, but he had more of a question on what do you think about six jaw chucks for chambering? And obviously I'm all for it. My, my Colchester has a Pratt & Bernard um, I love that chuck. That, that's a wonderful, wonderful chuck. Uh, this is a Bison True Set, six jaw. These are really nice chucks. You know, you, you pay for those, uh, but the benefit is, is you can dial these things in amazingly accurate. Um, and uh, in the order of clamping from best to okay, um, your collet system in my opinion would be the best form of clamping followed by the six jaw then the four jaw and then the three jaw not just because of repeatability but because of just uh, distortion um, you know if you if you clamp things with a four jaw chuck even a rifle barrel you're gonna build some distortion into that um, the six jaw chuck 
uh, you get better clamping because it's a more uniform clamping force and you're not getting as much distortion. Basically, this is almost as nice as a collet. Uh, if they'd make a collet that I could still run barrels through the headstock with, that's what I would use, but they don't, so this is what I use. Um, that's one reason I use the six jaw. Uh, two, when you get into the copper wire and the aluminum wire, if you're going to use wire, I'm a big fan of uh, aluminium or aluminum, however you want to say it. I like aluminium. It, it sounds a lot more fancy um, than, than what it is, but aluminium is an excellent, excellent uh, gripper of things. Uh, that being said, what's nice about the six jaw is first off, uh, what I do, uh, like this is a known uh, good, uh, by good I mean it's precision ground, uh, so that I know it's round. Um, this is an end mill. It's a longer end mill, so I have a pretty good shank, so this is gripped all across the shank. So what I did is I chucked that up in the six jaw, measured the run out. That was within three ten thousandths right off the bat. Um, it's a scroll chuck. So you scroll in on these and then I have the ability to dial that in with these four adjustment screws. Uh, why is that important? Let's wheel this in and I just make sure it's not going to hit the, hit the chuck. And I'm going to zoom in. And I'm going to come down here just so you know that uh, I've got it so that there is still plenty of movement in there. It's not bottomed out. Um, and then let's watch that dial. This is a 10,000th indicator or a 10,000th dial indicator. Um, I verified this with my bestest 10th uh, thou indicator. I don't like to do use my good good indicators for demo because that's usually when I'll drop them or knock them and I just had got one my Minitoyo back from having it recalibrated but you can see there's no movement so this end mill is dialed in to a ten thousandth um, that's the benefit to the true set or set true chucks depending on the maker and what they call it is you can get a lot of that run out uh, dialed right out of right out of whatever the part you're you're turning. Um, so, like this is a bison. It's very good. I believe my buddy um, he bought a gator, and he's that fixed all his problems. Uh, TMX makes a good one. Um, so you know, really really good investment. Uh, six inch is great. That's what I got for this. Was a six inch or six and a quarter, I guess, six and a quarter uh, true set, six jaw chuck, I think will fit perfectly with this machine. Um, but you don't see a lot of people talk about that. And again, I'll do a whole video on clamping force and why I use that later. But I wanted this to be set up turnkey uh, for me. Um, and pretty much it is. Uh, um, so the, the, once that's all done, let me get that backed out of the way. Uh, once that's all done, the next thing I want to do, or that I did is I went through and verified the accuracy of uh, the dials on the cross slide, the compound, and the carriage, and uh, with a dial indicator, and checked repeatability and accuracy on the DRO. And that was one thing a lot of people said about the Grizzly DRO is it's actually pretty good. Um, if I actually get into using that, it does way more than, than I'll ever uh, do with it. Um, you can program offsets and program tooling, you know, tooling offsets and all that. And it does calcul calculations and little half diameters for you. And it do does more than I will ever need it to do. Um, but surprisingly, Everything with this machine has been uh, spot on, um, which really makes me happy. I'm, I'm, um, I've done, like I said, I've done a lot of piddling with it. Um, I've done a couple mock uh, chambers with it, 
and those have been within a ten, uh, one ten thousandth to a uh, tenth and a half uh, total indicated run out. And so what do I mean by total indicated run out? What am I talking about that on a chamber? It means from the base to where the shoulder starts. I want it as round as possible here all the way through to where the shoulder starts. And any variation in there is going to be, you add that up, that's your total indicated run out. So a tenth to a tenth and a half is, uh, in the, in the, um, I wasn't using good, good cutting fluid either. It's, it's, you know, just pretty much just letting it rip and um, seeing what we got. So I, I'm expecting some really good things out of this machine. Um, I've been, so far I've been pretty impressed. Um, one thing, and that is something that we're going to do, is I'll go ahead and fire it up. Um, it is, uh, this is 220. Uh, what was nice is unlike all my other machines that have DROs, like my big blue lathe has DROs, uh, my Alliant uh, uh, 10 by 52 uh, variable speed mill has a DRO. Um, what's nice about this is everything's integral to the machine, so it's just one plug. Meaning I didn't have to have an extra outlet for this. I didn't have an extra outlet for the light or the pump or anything. It's just one plug. Everything works. Uh, so that's, that's really nice. Um, let's go ahead. Because uh, the other thing that really kind of impressed me uh, a bit is the, the noise of the machine. It's really a relatively quiet machine. Um, and it's very consistent throughout the gear ranges as far as gear wine. Um, the jet, that was one thing that always drove me crazy with my old jet lathe, was there were some gears that you would use and it, it, and it, it never affected anything, like it never affected the finish or chatter or dimensions, but it would just send coyotes to howling and the cats to running. Um, th there was some gears in there that would just scream. Uh, this one's pretty consistent through all the gears. You, you know, when you're really turning, you know, you'll get a little bit of whine, but I've heard a lot of machines that really go to whining uh, pretty, pretty bad. And this, this one is not. So let's go ahead and uh, we'll get it fired up and we'll run it through probably 7,300, uh, 460, and then we'll do the two, the two high gears, which is 1255 and 2000. Um, so we'll start with 70. And, uh, you, you know, that was something else that really for a brand new machine, the dials are, everything works pretty good. I mean, with a gear head, you're always going to have to kind of turn the chuck uh, to get things to mash. Um, but I, I guess I expected it to, to fight a little bit, and it really doesn't. The only thing, the only two things I wish that this machine did uh, is I wished it had a dedicated neutral uh, that you could just put the headstock in neutral. Um, I don't know that I have a machine that, the closing didn't have a dedicated, but it was pretty easy to put it in neutral. Um, my big blue lathe has a, has a neutral. Um, and I wish it didn't have as many uh, I didn't have to change gears as much as I do, but for the price point, again, I'm not I'm not complaining at all. That's that's just a, you know, there are things you got to be aware of. Um, so outside of that, let's get it fired up, and you can listen to it. This is uh, 70 RPM. If I got everything turned on right, uh, one thing I'll say that I see people do all the time is they'll go ahead and fire that machine up with the, the the jaws not clamped down or clamped down on something. You really shouldn't do that. Um, if, if you're going to mess around like that, just take take the chuck off and just do it with a dry spindle. Um, but if you're going to run the machine, you know, make sure the jaws are clamped down. Um, so everything's all set. And uh, 70 RPM, here we go. So that's that's not too bad. I just kind of move over a little bit so I can run the machine a little better. 
Um, that 70 runs pretty good. The other thing is there's no vibration in this machine. Um, some, sometimes what I do if I get one that's real whiny is I'll take my, I have a micron test indicator uh, which is, it's not a lot different than my half a hundred thousandth indicator. It's just the micron is, is 300, 3.9 something a uh, hundred thousandths of an inch. Um, is just shy of 400 thousandths and I'll just set it all over the machine and you'll watch it when it when it goes to vibrate and she'll just you'll watch that needle just go crazy um, and this this is really pretty pretty solid that way so it's uh, it's really kind of exceeded my expectations a little bit um, but anyway that was 70 we're gonna jump up to uh, 300 which I believe is position, yeah, position two. This is 300 RPM. Again, if you listen to the machine, it's, it's pretty constant. Not a big, not a big difference in, in uh, noise level uh, from gear to gear. You'll get, you, there will be some, but it, it shouldn't be like night and day I don't think like my jet was so now we're going to go up to uh, 460 which is high in uh, section 4 so this is 460 RPM really nice you can hear we got a little bit of a, a hum with the higher RPM Got a quick stop foot brake too. I really, really like that. That that would be handy if you're cutting metric threads. Um, and if we ran through all the gears, you would hear that because the RPMs increase, that will uh, amplify, but it's not like savagely different and annoyingly loud. Uh, so now we're going to go to uh, 1,255 RPMs. You got, you got to reset the power when you use the brake and make sure we get it in gear. 1,255 RPMs. There's, there's no, no vibration out of this whatsoever. Instant stop with the foot brake. And now we'll go up to the Big Daddy 2000 RPMs. And this is something I never really, uh, this is something I never felt comfortable doing with the smaller lays. My Colchester, 2000 all day long, but that's a short, squatty, very, very heavy lathe. Um, that 12 by 36, it was just kind of scary. Uh, but here we go, 2000 RPM. Again, uh, pretty good. Uh, the noise level is, is well within uh, my acceptable, uh, well within acceptable range to me. Um, I don't do a lot of gunsmithing up there around 1255 or 2000. Um, I can see that 460, uh, 300, 190, 125 is probably where I'm gonna be running a lot. Um, I like to do my threading on this machine, probably right around 190, 300. Uh, it'll depend on, on um, you know, just really putting, putting uh, you know, cutting threads on it and putting them under the comparator to see where the better finish is. Um, chambering, I'm gonna be running 70 or 125. Um, so that's, that's pretty much where it's gonna spend its life. Uh, but anyway, that's the new lathe. Um, from here, like I mentioned, we're going to get into, um, I'm going to do a whole video on lathe setup, um, how to true your lathe. Um, I think that's a, a, good, a good starting place to kind of start wrapping your head around precision. Um, and then we're going to start making some chips and eventually roll right into chambering. I, I really want this to go kind of in a chronological order. Um, so it kind of makes sense and we'll cover all the, all the tools that I, I use along the way. 
as right right at the beginning of the video. That's kind of the plan. Uh, so be on the lookout for those. Uh, anyway, y'all, thanks for watching. I hope you found value in this. I'm really looking forward to seeing what this machine could do uh, or can do. My expectations are, are are pretty good. I feel a lot better about it. Um, you know, you're you're always, you know, when you use good quality. You know, I love my Colchester, and and that'll be back. But uh, I think I think this is going to be a pretty decent little machine. Um, we'll see, and we'll see together. Uh, but anyway, thanks for watching. Um, please don't be afraid to like and subscribe if you so choose. I'd appreciate it. And we'll catch you in the next video.